today this part three of the series anticipating advent i'll be sharing with you on joy reflecting on isaiah chapter 12 from verse 1 to 6 and i'll be reading from the new american bible the passage reads on that day you will say i give you thanks o lord Though you have been angry with me, your anger has abated and you have consoled me. God indeed is my salvation. I am confident and unafraid. For the Lord is my strength and my mind, and he has been my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the fountains of salvation. And you will say on that day, Give thanks to the Lord, acclaim his name. Among the nations, make known his deeds. Proclaim how exalted is his name. Sing praise to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known throughout all the earth. Shout with exaltation, city of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. This is a beautiful passage, dear friends. Today I share with you on joy. We've walked on hope, we've walked on peace. Today, joy. Just take a moment and look at joy. You know, I make a distinction between joy and happiness. Joy is what warms the heart. Happiness brings smile to the face. Happiness usually is something external. Joy comes from within. People can be happy without God, but you cannot be joyful without God because God becomes your source. And also, you are not joyful because everything around you is perfect or okay or put together. You are joyful because the one who feeds your soul and your heart is God, who is the Father of us all and the one who knows us and the one who provides our needs. So that becomes something to pray for as we anticipate Advent, joy. But when we look at the, the context of that passage, the historical context is that this passage is part of a song of praise that follows prophecies of judgment and deliverance, as we read in the prophecy of Isaiah. So Isaiah is 12 is situated in a section of the book that deals with the aftermath of God's judgment on Israel and the promise of a future restoration. You know, you are in the midst of crisis. You feel you're suffering, you feel down. There's so many things going around you, questions unanswered, uncertainty of life, things that life throw at you, but yet, there's that silent voice within that tells you this too shall pass away. This will not take you. And not taking you, I don't mean physical. It's not taking you for what really matter, our soul. So the people of Judea were living under the threat of the Assyrian domination. So the verse offers a vision of hope and salvation. And that makes me think of our lives. Sometimes we get caught up in the mission that we forget the vision. Just like me as a priest. I might just love what I do as a priest and not really being a priest. But if I don't pay attention intentionally to keep reminding myself 
why I became a priest in the first place. My attitude to the mission will be something that will be lacking. It will be something that I will struggle with to become a burden instead of something joyful. So the vision of hope and salvation becomes strength for the Israelites and for us in the midst of crisis, in the midst of difficulties, in the midst of situations that we cannot control, situations that we have no control about. So that makes me to think that sometimes we might be praying for healing and forget to pray for the healing of our attitude. We might be praying for healing and forget to pray for healing of our attitude. What does that mean? You know, there are situations we cannot change, the situations that will never change no matter what we do. But we can ask God to heal our attitude in the midst of those situations so that our life become a manifestation of joy that know no bounds. Joy that no situation can even stop. Joy that no situation, circumstance, happenstances, peer persons, crisis can take. That's not an easy thing. That's why we pray for it. Happiness, you don't really have to pray for it. And sometimes we use joy, happiness, the same. But when you think about it, happiness is dependence, is conditional on what is happening at each moment. But joy is dependent on God despite what is happening at every moment. So that's where we need to be. So the vision, the vision of hope and salvation becomes strength in the midst of all this crisis. So what is the prophetic message? The passage speaks of trust in God and joy of our salvation. You cannot trust, you cannot have joy of your salvation if you do not trust in the Savior. You cannot have joy that despite what is happening around me, I still trust my God because He is good at all times. So Isaiah 12, one begins with a declaration of trust in God who is described as a source of strength and salvation. Verses 3 to 6 continue with the imagery of drawing water from the wells or the fountain of salvation depending on the particular um, um, version of the Bible you are reading from. Let's take a moment of a well. You and I know, or those of us who are familiar with wells, understand that there's water. But the degree or the sustenance of the water is dependent on how much you can dig. You can get excited and dig to a certain place and was and decided that, oh, there is water, 10 years it will stop flowing. The problem is not the water. The problem is that we were not intentional in digging to a stipulated level, being sensitive to the location, and being hopeful for the outcome. Sometimes you can be sensitive of the location but you have no control of the outcome. Joy helps you to stay calm. It helps you to stay afloat. It helps you to still hang in there, knowing that my hope in God, nothing will happen to it. So this passage from this imagery of the water, from the well of salvation, symbolizes the abundance and refreshment that comes from God's deliverance. The abundance is there. Is there. And it brings renewal. It brings refreshment. It brings joy. Joy 
joy, joy. What is the theological significance? The song of praise reflects the broader themes of Isaiah, including God's sovereignty, the promise of salvation, the call to trust in Him, which emphasizes that salvation is not just future hope. It's not something that comes in the future, but also a present reality that brings joy and transformation. We cannot wait until we are about to die because we have no control to start living as people who are children of the kingdom. We cannot. We cannot wait until our salvation is certain, until we, be, we begin to have joy. So we begin to live the reality of that salvation, even here and now. That's why St. Paul tells us in the scriptures, walk out your salvation in fear and trembling. You can't be too sure. So begin now to have and pray for the attitude of one who is saved. And that means being proactive with the vocation God has given and the call that God makes on you and on me. The liturgical use of this passage in, in a Christian tradition is that these verses are often associated with Advent and Christmas. That's what we're anticipating. We're anticipating Advent to prepare for Christmas. So celebrating the coming of Christ as the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation. The imagery of water and well is also significant in Christian baptism which symbolizes new life and cleansing that comes from baptism. That we are cleansed and then we are made new and become adopted children of God the Father, and sharing in a family that is bigger than our broad relationship, that binds us together. And the Eucharist is the most beautiful way to unite, is the most beautiful gift of Christ himself, who is the priest and the victim. In, on the altar of sacrifice, the Eucharist, all are made one. So it becomes something shameful, really, for us to gather to celebrate, and we can be one. We speak to each other in a way that is dehumanizing. We talk about a group in a way that doesn't uphold their dignity. We put a tag on people and forget to look at who they are and not just what they do, and then begin and then we see ourselves having conditional love instead of unconditional love that the Eucharist manifests as we gather around it. There are five areas that this passage speaks to in concrete ways and that I would like to share with you in conclusion. The first is trust in, and confidence in God because the passage begins with declaration of trust, like I said. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. That's powerful. That's beautiful. That's joy. Because this emphasizes the importance of placing our confidence in God, not in something external. Happiness is when something external happens and then we are happy. And when it doesn't happen. You hear people say, oh, I'm no longer happy in my relationship. What changed? What changed? What changed? But if you are joyful, things may work not the way you want, but your source is in God, our salvation. So it encourages us to rely on God in all circumstances, especially during times of uncertainty. Instead of giving in to Fear were given to faith and hope so that our hope gives us peace and our peace brings joy. The second is that God is our strength and our sound. The Lord is the Lord Himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation, which highlights God's role as both our protector and our source of joy. He not only protests. But our joy comes from Him, which reminds us that God not only saves, but also empowers us and fills our hearts with gladness, the joy of my salvation. And then third, the, the joyful response to, to salvation. It is a call to shout aloud and sing for joy. 
the natural response to experiencing God's salvation because it encourages us to express our gratitude and joy through worship and praise. You know, in church, you see people joyful, dancing, singing. doesn't mean that life is all okay for them. But they, they are before their God, who is the source of their strength and joy, who is the joy of their salvation. And also, it becomes a testimony to someone. It becomes a witness of your fidelity and understanding of the goodness of God despite what is going on around you. So you trust in Him, you come to Him, you give Him all you all you that you are, and then let Him be all for you. And then fourth, proclaiming God's deeds. The passage also encourages us to make known among nations what He has done. Don't hold it in. Be the witness of what God does. You know, that reminds me also that sometimes I share that on my Twitter this week, that sometimes we ministers, priests, and just speak so much about faithfulness of God. Nothing wrong about it. But we take time to teach people about the faith that helps them to know and understand that God is faithful, despite what is going on around them. Do we just talk, oh, God is faithful, God is this, God is that? What about us? Do we pay attention to present the attitude that will be healed, our faith to be strengthened, our hope to be nourished, so that what God says, which is true and uncertain, consistent and constant, that what He says we can understand and believe. So the joyful response and, and the, the, the reminder that our experience of God's grace should inspire us to be witnesses of His love and mercy. And lastly, God's presence among us. That's a beautiful thing to know. That passage ends, shot with exaltation, city of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. What a joy that the Holy One of Israel is in our midst. And then something for you to think about, my dear friends. Have you thought about this situation? That this passage, Isaiah chapter 12, is only six verses. What does that say in context to what we're saying? that there might be a multitude of things that are happening around you to take away your joy, to push you down, to trash you, to beat you up. But if you have the courage to take a few seconds, you will find one thing that will restore your joy, and that is God. That most of these passages that have judgment, have that have woes, uh, the, this, the, the narrative of the exile of the people of Israel, and this chapter 12 comes in between, just only six verses. And then ending for the people to be mindful that in their midst is the Holy One of Israel, that despite the chaos, the anarchy, the uncertainty, the fear around us, the Holy One is in our, is in our midst. What is strength and what a joy. What is strength that that brings. May Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word, be our source of joy. May He come to be with us, to be in us, to go with us. May He renew our strength and make us know and understand that He is our joy and our salvation. Amen.